welcome back for the second uh, of the panels put together by Gordy and John and uh, and and the the folks from the FAA and AVMED applications. Thank you all. Um, and and uh, if Gordy is ready, I'm going to hand it back over to him, and we'll see where we go from here. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, I am ready. And if you can bring up the slide deck, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> I don't have my uh, Alaska hat. I wish I would because uh, I'm uh, I'm Walter Combs right now. So uh, um, trying to fill his shoes, which are, are very big shoes. Like I said early on, Walter's uh, at the the JRC meeting today, and uh, <laughs> he made a comment to me earlier that. <clears throat> You know, basically, he's hoping to get some funding for this VWAS and weather cameras to expand outside of Alaska. And if uh, if he falls on his face, he may have to look for another line of work. So <laughs> let's all wish him luck. Hey, Gordy, uh, for, yes. for the for the folks who are on the call who are not as deeply embedded in the Ooh. FAA acquisition process as you are, will you decode JRC for them, please? It's the Joint Review Community uh, Joint Review. Uh, committee. It's the uh, it's the uh, it's the folks that that throw the weight behind getting the funding, um, you know, for for uh, different programs. And they've been they've been on board with this um, really since the beginning. Um, obviously, they want to know the details, the technical details. And so Walter's uh, getting getting down in the weeds a little bit further than than we will here, um, <clears throat> as far as the evolution of the VWAS system. So that's that's what Walter's doing today. Uh, and unfortunately, he, he's not here. He may be able to join a little bit later on. And if he does, we can, uh, you know, maybe uh, fill in any questions that uh, that come up that that I cannot uh, I can't hit. So. Um, so we'll go to slide one. So on the agenda for uh, panel two, um, <clears throat> basically, we're, we're pitching VWAS as an affordable alternative to AWAS. Uh, I'll cover the uh, the June 2020 initial development and testing. Uh, this fall, what we're going to plan to do with demonstration of capability. And then at the end of this, I will talk about how we how Walter's planning to expand the weather camera program to Hawaii and the CONUS. Next slide, please. OK, so we've called this the silver standard. Um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, visual weather observation system. We started off by calling it the validated weather observation system, but it really is a self-validating system, and and so it, it does it does physical checks internally, and uh, and and it, it won't it won't provide bad data, um, and it will alert the um, the Walters group if if a sensor's failed. So. It, it has some similar functionality to the AWAS, but you know we, we don't have to worry about temperature sensors reading 85 degrees on the north slope. Um, so uh, that's that's the that's the plan anyway. It's uh, it's designed to modernize the platform. Uh, it's non-certified supplemental weather observation. The way we're, we're starting this off anyway. Um, <clears throat> it, like I said, self self validating, self reporting. The uh, cost is 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 um, Walter um, John and I, Walter and Scott were up up in Alaska last fall for the NTSB safety roundtable meeting, and and we went out and we visited some of the weather sites up there, and 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 Walter said, I call it my, uh, um, it's basically a factor of tens, ten times cheaper, ten times ten times better, and ten times more reliable, and the 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 cheaper. Yes, we're proving that already. Um, the more reliable and better, we're hopeful that through this demonstration phase, we'll be able to do just that. So we're going to see, we're going to see some uh, added functionality that uh, we hope hope industry will really like. Um, <clears throat> the weather cameras, um, PO is capable of their, their their office is capable of installing 100 systems over five years, which is a huge huge. Um, uh, under tasking, undertaking, but uh, that's something they 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 figure they can easily do 20 a year. Uh, next slide. Um, the 360 degree uh, webcam. Uh, so 
uh, we'll show up a demo of this or Matt will run a demo of this at the end when we take some questions. I didn't want to do it in the in the presentation, but um, you can see this is just a snapshot of what's going on here at, at uh, Palmer right now. Well, this isn't right now, but this was a snapshot of Palmer, Alaska. It allows for 360 degrees, uh, night vision enabled. Uh, it has pan, tilt, and zoom capability. And you couple that with an AWOS at, at locations where AWOS is installed or the VWAS, and you get the you get the big picture. Um, it improves pilot pilot situation awareness and, and flight management services. And we use that term, Walter uses that term, it's basically your dispatchers or your pilots doing their pre-flight briefing or your uh, your uh, uh, flight service station uh, briefers who are who are utilizing the tools. So um, we're hopeful that this will be a, a huge improvement for those folks. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the characteristics of the VWAS. So there's a design little spec there on the right of what it looks like or how it was uh, designed and laid out. Um, it has weather, it has camera images, it has ceiling, visibility, pressure, winds, temperature, humidity, rainfall, and others. Um, it's advisory right now, so it's non-certified, but you'll see a little later on how we plan to, to get it to a certified state. Uh, <clears throat> it's enhanced industry standards um, sensors, so that they do self self accuracy and self validation, self reporting. Uh, uses IP telecommunications uh, network. Excuse me, I can't see my whole screen there. Uh, and then and then uh, cloud network data processing. Um, one of the beauties of, of the weather camera program now is they've migrated to the cloud. And so the the cost to the FAA to house the 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 uh, all the photos and all the images is is minuscule because it's it's uh, out on the out on the cloud. Um, so the APIs support the data sharing so it can be supported with uh, other you know other um, vendors who want to take the imagery and, and use it on their own on the websites or something like that. So open source. Next slide. Uh, this is a this is a uh, kind of prototype of what it's going to look like. Uh, you're going to see on the, the left hand pane there <clears throat> the uh, the camera loop, um, and you can you can see all the different uh, functionality you have. You can pull up the sectional. You can pull up the airport info, just like you have to today's weather cams site. Um, you know you can pull up the notams and things like that. On the right hand side, this is a notional what what they're looking at. So you've got the trend in the uh, left column, the current observation in the center column, and then and then the AAG or the the TAF information would be in the right column. So importing all that kind of give you a sensor technology. So you can see just running through there, you've got <clears throat> uh, six hours in the past, um, how the temperature has trended and what the current temperature is and what the, the future hours it's looking at from lamp information. Dew point, uh, pressure, uh, obviously we're not going to forecast pressure, but um, you know where information is available, it'll be in the, you'll, you'll have forecast information. So you can see just at a, at a glance how this kind of gives the, uh, the pilot or the briefer the, um, um, the ability to kind of uh, take one snapshot look at, at, at how this is, uh, laid out and, and the, the value added with the VWAS. Next slide, please. Uh, the benefits, uh, it's effective, accurate, validated weather observations. It supports aviation observations where METARs don't exist. They're not cost effective to install them. It enables the National Weather Service forecast products to improve. David talked about that, how you're very limited in the scope there and the the model data how it how it varies tremendously and when it gets when it gets ground source when it gets truth data how that makes a huge improvement so we're, we're really hopeful this is going to be a win-win for everyone the low cost 10 percent and responsive the, the, the ability to install 20 more 20 or more systems per year which awas uh, um, currently we can't do that just due to the um, the the amount of um, <clears throat> Uh, siting and everything else that that goes into you know getting the concrete, getting everything established, getting the long line established, getting the the VHF radio frequencies and and all the all the the infrastructure installed with uh, uh, AWOS is uh, this is this is much more flexible. Next slide, please. So the initial test and development is going to be at Palmer. 
um, starting in May, the hardwell installation will go in. That's on, on track. From June to September, uh, they'll be doing an operational test. We'll be doing a side-by-side -side comparison of the AWOS versus the VWAS, and, and uh, we've got the uh, um, Andy, Andy McClure, the, the um, flight services folks up there. They're going to be doing taking uh, human observations, so we'll be able to, to kind of get a good cross section of uh, of data and, and see how the VWAS uh, compares and contrasts to that. Uh, we'll get the flight service to give us their review and inputs. And one of the things that Walter's always done, and he's done very well, is he's taken input from flight service. He's taken input from the pilot. And, and he's, he'll be doing the same thing with the VWAS. So, so that's kind of the plan on the initial test and development. Next slide. Um, operational demonstration of capability. So that's, that's the next phase of this. That will uh, start roughly in September and go through June of 2021. Uh, VWAS will be installed at three Alaska airports. That, that's to be determined. One of them we have an eye on. Um, it will be installed at a location that uh, uh, in, an RNAV approach is being developed for that that location in support of uh, operations there. So, so we're hopeful that will be a huge win for that. Um, <clears throat> we're looking for volunteer commercial operators. Uh, we did have um, uh, Raven um, agreed. Um, Tatundek was interested uh, along with some 135s. Unfortunately, uh, Raven filed Chapter 11. Uh, so it puts us a little bit of a loss here, but we'll we'll try to reach out to some more 135s in, in, that operate into a, in the Alaska area, and, and um, hopefully we'll have some good development there. So we'll have uh, FAA flight services dispatchers and flight followers. The dispatchers and flight followers they will be uh, they'll be given the software um, and to use the the AvCams Plus site. Uh, it's kind of currently in development that that hosts the information and we'll be able to they'll be able to um, uh, do some good flight following and monitoring and and do briefing off of that site. So that will be an improvement for them. Um, obviously, flight standards going to be uh, deeply involved in this. John, myself, Scott and others will be involved in, the, in, in how this is working, um, getting a data comparison to the to the AWOS. And, and really working within the lines of business within the FAA and um, <clears throat> our uh, our folks in uh, ANGC6 to get everybody kind of on board with, uh, with with where we're going with this, receive the appropriate feedback, um, see what we're, where we need improvements, um, see how good it is, and and really try to take the the, the um, ex expand the operation in Alaska. Uh, working with the flight procedures folks too, like I said, we'll be, uh, we're, we've already been in contact with them about uh, RNAV approaches that they plan to uh, develop and, uh, and how this can be um, a benefit to them. Just as an anecdotal, I think there are 27 and the number may not be 100% correct. It's in the 20s, mid 20s, a number of uh, RNAV approaches in the state of Alaska without any weather information. So flight procedures have been developing that and, and and it just doesn't, the, the number of operations just doesn't, the cost benefit wasn't there to, to or the money wasn't there for an AWAS. So that's where that uh, um, we see as a huge win for that. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> develop the VWAS standard. Um, let me see here. So uh, FAA operational requirements for usage. Um, hang on a second, let me get back to that. Uh, Gordy, I must say you're doing a wonderful job briefing somebody else's slides. I yeah, hate it, doing that. It, it, uh, you know now 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 I'm into the now I'm into the area where I'm not as comfortable with the material and I'm trying I'm trying to put on my Walter Combs hat here. So, <laughs> um, yeah, hang on just a second. So. Um, the, the plan is for the FAA to um, uh, basically establish the operational requirements for usage. So once we know how good it is, it, it's kind of similar to the AAG. And for you, those of you up in Alaska uh, or those of you that follow some of the FAA um, um, data that we put out, we just we just released an info. Uh, um, information for operators is, is what it is. And it's a flight standards document. Basically, 
it outlined what what the AAG is and 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 how it should be utilized. Okay, um, please realize that it it is not a TAF, the AAG, for example, and this is not a METAR, not yet anyway. So we will have to maybe put some limitations on this. We're not 100% sure, um, but there's always ways to mitigate certain things. Uh, you know, when you're when you're missing weather information. Just as a big for example, we have uh, um, the legislation that allowed us to do a 121 operations VFR in airports without weather information. Yeah, pilots can land without weather information. Is it smart to do a 365 um, uh, 24 7? No, it's not. But can it be done? Yes, it can be done. Well, there's ways to mitigate certain things. Um, some things uh, you're you're just not going to want to operate without. So once we once we have the data, we'll be able to determine if there's a, a sort of mitigations that are need to be um, need to be done. Our our planned expansion uh, approvals outside of uh, Alaska and Hawaii. You know what what Walter's doing right now, how he's how he's continuing to promote and keep that keep pushing that rope up the hill as far as we know there's a need. We certainly know there's a need for uh, additional weather reporting and forecasting. How can we get there? Um, so so that's that's really the, the, the keep the eye on the future. Performance based sensor requirements. Uh, right now we have prescriptive based sensor requirements. The sensor requirements are are detailed. They're documented. They have to meet that they are this. Um, the thought process is to, to switch to a more performance based sensor requirement. Once again, if it gets this high and can reach this this threshold, it might operate up here, but it can't operate less than here. So that's that's really the stipulation that that uh, we're hoping to develop these sensor requirements for that. And that will include uh, uh, folks out over in uh, ANGC 6 as this evolves. Um, uh, developing a spec. Um, and transmitting that to the industry. The, the thought process is there is maybe it's an advisory circular, maybe it's a uh, maybe it's an FAA document that says here's what the specifications to a VWAS have to beat. Um, you know, right now, like I said, the VWAS uh, current development is using currently approved Weissla sensors, and 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 we want to be able to develop the performance-based requirements so the specification will 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 follow after this so that's down the road a bit um, um, as far as when that will develop de be developed um, developing the, the data network the data pathway is similar to the METAR long line um, it makes the data immediately available for public consumption uh, it's not uh, go and find the information go search through matis uh, call um, uh, a phone number to a uh, to uh, um, a non-federal or, or non AWAS 3 airport and try to get to get the weather information to see what you can see. Um, so so make it make it easily available to the pilots and to the users. Uh, direct data feed right to the National Weather Service and industry. You know, we established this. They know it. They know how good it is and they can ingest it and use it. Use it appropriately. Next slide, please. So um, the webcams. Uh, outside of Alaska. So in Hawaii, the, the plan is to install 23 camera systems. Uh, we have congressional funds to install the first 10 sites. Um, the uh, we thought we had enough money to do them all, but um, due to certain requirements in the state of Hawaii, uh, the costs are coming in exceedingly more uh, higher than we thought. So they're going to we're going to work with uh, internally to get uh, a, a future funds to complete the remaining 13 sites. So 23 sites total. Those have been identified uh, based on an NTSB recommendation. I'll kind of get to that here in a little bit. Uh, in the CONUS, uh, we're planning to integrate a state DOT owned camera images into the webcams website. We're beginning with the state of Colorado. They've got a um, agreement with the state of Colorado um, and there'll be a, a, a payback uh, FAA cost reimbursement there um, so that we're going to plan to demonstrate the operational capability. Uh, uh, Colorado is really on board with this. I think other states will jump onto this uh, immediately. There's a lot of people with that 
with camera technology out there. Um, hopefully, um, those will all meet the, the 360 weather cam. Some of those don't right now, but the plan is to, to get to that to get to that that 360 camera technology standard so that a pilot will be able to um, brief themselves flying through any pass in Colorado, any any pass in Hawaii or uh, any pass up in Alaska. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the, the thought on the cameras is uh, Look before you fly. Don't fly out and take a look. It improves improves the go no, go no go decision making. Obviously, um, Don kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, and I, and I made a comment on the Kobe Bryant. Um, oh, he's not muted. Folks, please check your microphones or phones to mute. Um, I'm, but I'm, I'm muting it. everybody, Gordy. Hang on. Okay. okay. All right. I think he got it. Uh, so the current the current image uh, versus a clear day image on the cameras uh, pictures worth a thousand words it doesn't doesn't give you the the, the entire picture right so the vwas is going to fill that fill that void but one thing i will tell you is um uh angc6 has been working really well uh trying to come up use uh edge detection technology i don't know if jenny's on the line but maybe she can be asked questions and there is there is some some um there's some software that's been developed that, that is in test right now, or I'm told it's in test, that uh, you know could automatically detect um, cloud tops, for example, or visibility. So, so that's that's kind of the evolution we're hope hope to go with cameras, um, and and that that's been in work for a while. I think it's been briefed before, but uh, that that's that's progressing pretty well. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the one of the benefits of this new weather cams technology is the advancements that Walters put forth is a route based aviation uh, decision making tool, um, which you know similar to the flight path tool, but it allows the, the user to, to get the camera images and build the route, build your alternate route, uh, re retrieve uh, retrieve saved routes, um, so you don't have to do it every time. If you fly a certain route day in and day out, bam. Pull it up. There's your images. There's your weather information. So, a lot of value added to this uh, to this uh, software that's been developed. So, we're we're very we're very um, happy to see where Walter's gone with this. So, next slide. This is just a uh, sample of the system architecture. You've got the camera, a camera control unit, the the technology, the telecommunications network that he uses. He uses cellular, VSAT, radio link, cable modems, DSL. I mean, he he gets the information through many different ways based on the location it's at, and and that will continue as these things evolve into the lower 48 or in Hawaii the same way. Um, the uh, it, it goes to the cloud, as I said, so it it really reduces the the cost of expansion tremendously for the FAA, which is a huge plus. Next slide. So the justification to, uh, to to fill the performance gap. So we've got three uh, NTSB recommendations here. We've we've got the one that was for Hawaii, initiate an aviation weather camera program uh, in Hawaii that includes installation and maintenance of aviation weather cameras at critical locations. The locations have been have been established. We know where they are. The plan is to start rolling it out, as I uh, alluded to in the previous slides. The CONUS. Um, also, areas have been identified in the CONUS. There's, I think there's uh, 160 or 70 of those. I don't don't quote me on the number. So it's considerably more in the CONUS, but it's also similar. Install and maintain aviation weather cameras in these mountain passes. Uh, in in the thought process is is the cameras, um, you know, in Hawaii for sure will include the VWAS. So not only do you get the camera imagery. You'll get uh, you'll get all the other aviation weather elements too, which will enhance the uh, the weather picture. Uh, we also trying to fill a void here with flight service, equip flight service service station specialists responsible for Hawaii and the continental U.S. with technical capabilities, training, provide verbal pre-flight and interim briefings using aviation weather camera imagery. Well, we got to have the images images first, so the plan is to is to fill that uh, fill that void too, working with. Uh, Mike Helwig and others in uh, 
in flight services to to uh, to train the, the folks. So we got to get them the images and then train them on the images. OK, so um, what do we have? We have uh, one point eight million dollars uh, in fiscal year 2020 funds to establish camera services outside of Alaska. And the highest priority was was Hawaii. Um, unfortunately, that that uh, those dollar amounts were chewed up by 10 sites, um, but we're looking for an additional two million to uh, finish the finish the uh, work and we're hopeful that we will get that money. So uh, timeline was uh, August of this year till September of 2022 for install and we're still shooting for that timeline. All right, um, more, a little bit more in Hawaii. So um, the engineering surveys were done. The infrastructures have been identified. The locations, uh, they, most of them possess electrical power, which is huge, uh, and it's two years to complete the, the process. And what else do we have? Oh, so the CONUS, um, the thought process on the CONUS now is to kind of leverage the uh, the already proven process that we've done with NAV Canada. So if you go to the Weather Camps website, you'll see there's 215 NAV Canada owned uh, sites that that any pilot can uh, access, and and that's been working for seven years. It's it's very uh, low effort for us. It's very low cost for the for the FAA to host this. So we're hopeful to kind of leverage that same philosophy with state owned camera systems. Obviously, they're not everybody's going to come up to speed on that. So we're we're looking at how we can fund um, the lower 48 um, and, and make it. Uh, safe and efficient um, and not just cover certain states, but really cover all the gaps in the lower 48. So that's that's also one of Walter's uh, side projects that he's working. And is that, let's see. OK, uh, state DOT is already interested. So um, yeah, other 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 um, states, Montana, Wyoming, Oregon, Washington, California, New Mexico, have already expressed interest and um, you know we think it's the first of many so Colorado is kind of the, the start of this this program it's it's ongoing right now and we're hopeful that the weather camp site will start hosting this uh, information very soon next steps um, <clears throat> so January of 21 to 23 the plan is to install up to 100 additional camera sites uh, systems in Alaska and install up to 170 in the in the Conus and mountains mountain states. Obviously, funding is key for all this. Um, that's one of the things Walter and others are working working towards. Um, and and we could even expand to additional camera sites in the state of Alaska if, or Hawaii if that's warranted. So there's a there's a web web webcam future case that uh, you know we're looking to to do um, for future expansion. And any questions? So um, I we probably have some questions, maybe not. If not, Matt, maybe now would be a good time to switch and go to the web browser. So, so uh, Gordy, Gordy, let's let's uh, let's go over to Dave because he's got a whole bunch of questions. I've been I've been looking, but in the meantime, before we do that, and then I'll I'll go over to the uh, to the the Palmer Weather Cam. I want to acknowledge that um, my my good friend Monsieur Eric Dupuis from NAV Canada is in fact on the call, and um, it, it was it was nice to hear that uh, uh, that that the FAA and NAV Canada are are um, learning from one another in in this respect. So uh, Eric, bonjour, comment ça va, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, well, I'm impressed, Matt. Um, so speaking of Eric. Uh, he and Matthias both had a question concerning the pan and tilt. Uh, Eric's uh, was specifically on uh, is a software or hardware uh, capability and Matthias wanted to know who can control it. Can a pilot looking at the site control these functions or not? Yes to both um, and, and Matt will show that here. Uh, real shortly, the the functionality it's currently in test, and we probably can share that that uh, that website. I will say that you know if Matt's controlling it, someone else can't control it because only one person can be in control of the camera at one time. But it it does have auto 
auto functionality where you can just click the button and it'll automatically um, do a 360 uh, rotation. Now the, the the tilt and zoom capability is is it's actually pretty nice the way they've de developed it. Um, it does also include um, the uh, terrain heights if if applicable. So it, it's got little bullets on the on the site there for the, for the train heights. So, and I think he's uh, Matt's throwing it up there right now. It, it, and Eric also asked uh, as a follow on to that, does it have a big, uh, which may have a big impact on uh, bandwidth usage? I mean, it was really the context of his question that I didn't complete the last part there. So, y yeah, and and that's that's why it's it's test and demonstration is huge. Um, it, it may have uh, bandwidth issues based on its location. Uh, that's kind of TBD. Uh, as far as the amount of uh, or what its limitations are, I would have to defer to Walter. Uh, maybe Matt just kind of mouse over one of those hills there that have the, the point and you just mouse over it. There's 600 uh, feet MSL at, at 4.5 miles. And this is this is a current, this is what it looks like currently now in Palmer, beautiful Palmer, Alaska. So if you're looking to take a vacation when the, when things open up, is there uh, is there any browser limitations on uh, on this that you're aware of? Not to my knowledge, no. I think it works with all browsers. But uh, um, if if I can't answer the question, I, I, I guess David, maybe we could um, just table those, and uh, we will we will make sure that uh, we get the question answered by Walter and his tech tech folks. Well, that was that was actually my question. I'll, oh, I'll okay. Not. Right. I'll not worry about it for now, but as it would be, there are a lot of questions uh, since this is not your presentation uh, as it would be. Um, yeah. So another one is uh, with regards to the VWAS system, can you provide any more detail on how you will be able to self-validate elements uh, where there is only a single sensor available, such as for ceiling uh, visibility or present weather? Um, I can't I can't tell you about the those three elements, but I can tell you so our self validation for pressure uh, pressure uh, it does have multiple sensors for pressure, so it will self validate for pressure. Um, I know that it a lot of that um, has to do with um, just uh, is it is it logical? Uh, for example, temperature if it was reporting you know minus four degrees C uh, last hour, did it go up to uh, you know, plus 25 degrees C this hour. Um, obviously, we've got a temperature sensor. So there's there's a range of tolerance, I think, in, in some of the elements that that um, uh, you know that that's that's where it does some of its, of its validation. Okay, and um, Donald uh, Verkoff is a question. I think he wants to buy one of these. It says, how much uh, are the VWAS stations now? Uh, they are well. The the current cost of what uh, Walter's given me is is one hundred and twenty thousand in in U.S. dollars. <laughs> well, so that 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 is the I mean that's the current cost. We are hopeful that once we develop this standard, uh, we're hopeful we'll be able to drive that cost down even further. And 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 the 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 whole philosophy there is is establish the standard and and allow competition. And uh, we're hopeful that you know some of the folks on the on the call here, or you know that maybe maybe they maybe their sensors, maybe their technology can meet this. Um, and and I'm sure they're probably chopping at the bit a little bit to to get in the game. And um, you know, we're we'll, we'll welcome all all comers. To be quite honest with you, Don Birchoff, you should be able to afford about a dozen of these things. Nice. Let's see when, hey, you get, uh, when you get one, maybe from Miter. Um, Okay, another question from uh, Cliff Johnson, uh, and it says it's for Gordy and Walter. How do you handle uh, cybersecurity issues with the weather cameras while balancing the need for operators to be able to use them? For instance, uh, are they uh, on loop and only authorized uh, users can do pan, zoom, and so forth? So I guess that's maybe a little related to what you said earlier, but yeah, uh, how yeah. is cybersecurity on this? I guess the, the 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 short answer to that is, you know, we'll have to get Walter to answer that question. I mean, right now it's it's open to the user, to any user. It might get locked down, um, you know, as far as the, the the pan tilt and zoom. I'm not exactly sure what the plan is to limit use. I mean, the 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 main philosophy is we're we're hopeful that the system will be utilized enough 
uh, in, in these remote locations or, or available enough in these remote locations so any user will be able to, well, someone's using it right now, well, they'll be off. Audio conferencing second. center. Please enter a conference ID followed by pound. I'll, I'll find him. Hang on a sec. Hey, Gordy, this is John. I believe when you access the site, it takes a snapshot of that picture in time, and up at the top left corner, you see the timestamp. And then as okay. you tilt and pan around, that's Sorry, a that specific shot. I can't shot. find a meeting with that um, number. There's also another Try function at the top right of the screen again. that will show a clear and day. It's so tall a clear day. So if you want to see what it, the visibility looks like on a, on a Cab OK day, you can select that function. Uh, Matt, maybe, maybe you want to try that. Uh, I think it's Homer McCready. Uh, that's looking. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Oh, here we go. I'm trying to move it somebody. There we go. There you go. You were right. Good, good call. Thank you, Gordy. Okay, sure. uh, John. One more time for me. Um, um, what what is it I'm doing? Toggle clear day. Toggle clear day. There you go. I guess John's point was that what it does is it takes a snapshot of the current imagery and allows you to, to zoom and, and pan on that current imagery so it won't impact any other user. Yeah, yeah, and, and somebody else, uh, I think I think Justin uh, uh, Hilliard said um, that that uh, you know th this is this is a snapshot and then what we're seeing here is the ability to manipulate that yep. that snapshot in time. Right. That makes sense. Yep. Uh, and Marilyn Pearson asked uh, if you anticipate including UAS operations in the testing phase. And I did see a comment later on about UAS being discussed in session three. So, but that seemed like a pretty succinct question. So, is that something y'all have looked at? No, the short answer is yes. Uh, we we requested funding, and, and John will get into this a little bit with with Kevin in the next uh, panel, but we requested funding to basically take the v VWAS, take it to a key test site and, and utilize this uh, to see what the impact is, if it's good enough information for UAS uh, de decision making, um, uh, you know, and, and how it will benefit the UAS world. So the long and the short of it is we're, we're hopeful that we can get there from here. Um, the the short-term money is to validate the, the VWAS for basically um, VFR operations and and move towards certification. All right, um, Jose Garcia wanted to know if will machine learning techniques be employed in the validation process? Wondering also about applying lessons learned from the uh, uh, NWP model data assimilation quality control experience for this. Jose, yes, oh, very good questions. Um, <laughs> and the short answer to that is I don't know. So uh, we'll, we'll, that's a very good answer. We'll give it, we'll give that one over to Walter. I can I can tee that one up over to Walter. Good question though. All right, and I I do believe that uh, this this will store in uh, memory here. So uh, we'll try to go through and parse out some of those that um, we need to follow up answers for with Walter. Excellent. Um. And this is from David. Another one. Let's see. What would the possibilities of AppCams hosting non-DOT uh, webcams, such as those from the private market, uh, specifically thinking about those existing webcam networks, such as Environmental Mesonet? Uh, that has been discussed, and, and that is also another option. Uh, you know, like I said, not all the webcams are going to be the pan, tilt, and zoom. This is the next phase of the webcams. Walter's on on generation two of his current webcams. If you, you you go to the webcam site, you'll see a lot of sites have have uh, the four quadrants covered, if you will, and they're all pointed one direction. Um, you know, it's got a point in space out there if there's terrain where, you know, if you can see this hill, ceilings are this much, the visibility is that much. Um, so that, that was phase two. This, this kind of notches that up even a little bit further, but the long and the short of it is we think that there's a there's tremendous value to hosting you know any camera information and that and utilizing that technology but you know we can follow up with walter on that question too i i, I do believe the short answer is going to be yes for sure we'll be able to do that walter is going to be uh i feel bad that he didn't uh, come he's so popular here <laughs> um 
he's a well, he's a he's a busy guy, and uh, and and I got to give the guy uh, kudos because he's he uh, I, I, we were talking about uh, chiseling his uh, face on one of those uh, stones out there in, a, in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> But just let us know which one it is when when that gets done. So, we, well, we're we, gonna make uh, him honorary governor or whatever, mayor mayor of Palmer or whatever. All right, and let's see. That one was answered. Um, yeah, I think if it takes a snapshot, we did that one. From a quick inspect, this from uh, Tom George. Let's see. From a quick inspection, many of the Colorado highway cams show little or no sky. Will there be some requirement on how cameras are pointed uh, to be included in the aviation network? And I'm assuming that the yeah, the, that, yeah. well that's that that is the, that's kind of the big thing. You know, it's it's like you know we looked at uh, you know Metis data, you know Mesonet data, and and said well Mesonet data is really actually pretty good, but Metis data in general. And said, "Well, can we open this up, and can we get, can we just make all that information available to the pilot world?" Well, there's not a lot of quality control in that, and 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 so, you know, you know, we figured, well, maybe it's better to build build our own standards. So, to answer the question, yeah, you know, many cameras they don't they don't see the the horizon. You know, they're looking at concrete, and so those would not be really too beneficial to the pilot, albeit, you know, some have some potential so it's it's kind of like uh you know walter would tell you if he's here that the sighting is a key a key element to a lot of this and and some of the cameras will will be able to meet that that spec others won't um but that's a great question and um you know i'm, I'm sure i'm sure we're willing to to host the, the imagery if it if it meets walter's uh minimum standard uh justin hillard says it may be good to clarify that this is a snapshot in time referring to the snapshots not a video feed okay right yeah um yeah takes uh, a snap <clears throat> i'm sorry go ahead no it takes a snapshot when you when you when you play with it there it, it takes a snapshot and you can zoom in on that snapshot um but i think if you put it in uh the auto rotate That'll be a new, that'll be a current image. Yeah, I, I did auto rotate earlier than I was starting to get nauseous, so I turned it off. Yeah, yeah, you might want to. <laughs> so you can see it says seven minutes ago in the upper. Yeah, and, and I've actually been experimenting here a little bit. Uh, there's a, a question and answer in the chat, a question from Bryce Ford, and I think Colleen Reiki answered it uh, uh, as far as the update rate. I, it looks like it's a 10 minute update rate. So that, that's the, 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 the biggest I've seen so far is this seven minutes ago. Let me just refresh the screen again. Now it's nine minutes ago. So I'd be willing yeah, to bet you lunch 1750, we're gonna get a new image. Yeah. It, and uh, here's a, a good question uh, from Michael Split. Uh, is, is there any self cleaning uh, such as weather, like an icing, I am assuming there's heated surfaces. Uh, or bird droppings and so forth, or just you know, dirt and grime. Uh, is there? Yeah, I, I think that I think bird dro bird droppings and 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 grime are are an issue. It is a heated surface. We do know it's a heated lens, so it will it will auto um, auto de-ice there. But um, yeah, I, I I don't know that you're going to be able to. I I don't know what his uh, current maintenance schedule is. I do know that you know Walter has. Given his uh, cell phone out and he's gotten calls, you know, at all hours that said, hey, there's bird droppings on the camera at such and such. So <laughs> it's it a lot dangerous. <laughs> uh, is there a possibility? This is from Scott, uh, Scott Sampson. Is there a possibility of validation using ground based pilot reports? Uh, for example, pilots that have just landed. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, most certainly there's a there's a you know, that that's the feedback we're looking for. Uh, when you talk VWAS, uh, is to gather that that you know that that pilot report once they land and say, okay, here's what it was reporting. What did you observe? Um, you know, we we did similar um, similar type of uh, 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 reporting when we when we developed the RCAM, the Runway Condition Assessment Matrix, uh, which is now the, the worldwide standard for for breaking action. 
Um, we did that in Alaska in in uh, in, in Michigan or the two starting spots where we did this and we received that feedback from the pilots. Well, you know, it should have been breaking action fair. What you you know, what did you uh, see it as? You know, what was the what was the the, the time frame between uh, the time that the image was taken or the report was taken on the RCAM and when the pilot landed? What was the weather since then? So you kind of get all the data in and then you say, well, how good is it? Apparently I owe everybody lunch because it's now 11 minutes old and it's I keep refreshing and it keeps getting older. <laughs> Well, and there was a question uh, which I thought we had answered there. It says, how often does the image uh, snapshot update to ensure users not looking at old image from Bryce Ford? And Colleen answered, I believe the refresh rate's about 10 minutes. And I think that's what we were just talking about. But I guess, how do you know, uh, you know, the timestamp's up in the corner, but. Yeah, it's an upper, upper left. Yeah. So, yeah. OK, well, that's all the questions we had. Uh, okay, good. Uh, all right. Uh, if no more questions, we'll move on to the the next uh, the next part of the show here for panel two. So, one of the other um, <clears throat> projects we're working with, in in funded by EFS 400 through the Weather TCRG, is uh, the validation of RTMA. And Danny Sims uh, has been integral in in working with uh, uh, folks at EMC and at the NSEP EMC folks to, to um, you know basically uh, determine what what you know, what the variability is and and how the data is presented and and how good is it so uh, Danny are you are you uh, on yes Gordy I'm on everybody hear me all right yep perfect fantastic so if you want to go ahead and go to the presentation all right, as, as Gordy teed it up there, uh, we were looking at the quality or the performance of the RTMA. How well does it do? And I want to just tell you what we have done and what we are going to do uh, so far with this assessment effort. But first of all, why are we even doing this? What is the problem? And this really grew out of when there are missing METAR information uh, at part 139 airports. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, uh, it's usually due to a hardware or software issue. And most of these airports do not have any type of human augmentation. So uh, you're left without information. And uh, a airline operators, they will either have to wait, they will have to divert, or they will have to cancel. And all those are negative impacts. And I think the only place that doesn't apply now is Alaska, as Gordy noted uh, in, in that last presentation. Uh, they can fly without an AB, ah, but I think that is the only place. So that's the problem. And so we're looking for solutions. So if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, we're looking at the RTMA, the real-time mesoscale analysis. If you're not familiar with that, that is a meteorological analysis that is produced by the National Weather Service. It's an operational product. And we have been, we, the FAA led this effort. We've been using this since 2015 for when temperature is missing. And you can see the various domains where, where um, it is being used. And so the question comes up, can we use it for other variables? And in order to do that, we had to determine how accurate it is. What is the performance? So next slide, please. And this just gives a little bit more more information about the RTMA itself. As I said, it's a gridded meteorological analysis tool. Um, it is used, it uses uh, numerical weather prediction fields. It uses multiple ones. It doesn't rely upon just one model, uh, but it supplements those that output from the weather prediction models with observations, surface observations, METARs, mesonets from states and university, roadway information systems, uh, many different ones. Uh, it uses buoys and ship surface-based observations from over water surfaces, and it does use some scat satellite capabilities also. So it combines all of those together in order to give a close fit to the observations and an analysis of what's going on at the current time. And you can see the grid spacings that we have available, 2.5 kilometer for CONUS, Hawaii and Puerto Rico, three kilometers for Alaska. 
There is an RTMA rapid update, the RU, which updates every 15 minutes. And then there is an hourly one, the RTMA itself. Now, I want to stress that originally this product was developed for National Weather Service forecasters, and that was its primary use. But it has evolved as, as more and more of us have looked at it to where we're looking at, can we use it beyond that original use? And so again, that goes back to trying to determine the performance of it. Um, next slide, please. This is just an example of uh, output from the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, it is a gridded product, so you can, you can show this graphically. You could take a grid point and have the value from it. Uh, and, and basically that's the beauty of gridded data. You can, you can slice and dice it and do what you want with it. And so if we're interested in a particular airport, we don't need a whole graphic and try to figure out where we are and what the value is. We can just hone in right into the grid itself and to the data and get that information. So again, just an example here of visibility and it's color coded to the different flight categories in this case. Next slide, please. So, and I'm gonna hit quickly just what we've done rather than going into a ton of detail because there was a lot of effort and, and you know, I, I'm a miss here. I, I, I need to say also that the ones who did this assessment for us were our partners over in the National Weather Service at the Environmental, Environmental Modeling Center, EMC. They are the ones who uh, did development work of the RTMA. They maintain it, uh, make new developments up, keep it running and so, uh, they did this assessment to it also, and, and, and my fault for not identifying them up, up front. So they did just a great uh, job here, a ton of work. So as I've said several times, we wanted to quantify the impact of missing observations. So we did a data denial experiment. There are 484 Part 139 airports in the CONUS. We took them all out. That's worst case scenario. We understand that. But that's also plausible if you were to have a network failure. Uh, what would RTMA give you in that case? We would have loved to have run uh, experiments where we took out a single airport and see what the results are, then go to another one and see what the results are. But that just simply was not feasible. It's, it's very computationally expensive to rerun hundreds of data denial experiments, time consuming, and, and as I said also, from the computer resources that are needed. So we just simply couldn't do that. But this worst case where we removed all the 139 airports, part 139 airports, it does produce a baseline that we can use for comparisons. And so that's what you're going to see as far as results, which we have from phase one. So next slide, please. So on the left-hand side is, is just some summations of the various variables and, and what we've seen out of it. Uh, so let's start with ceiling. We saw very good results for VFR conditions, um, less so for the, for the other flight categories, of course. But again, for, for VFR, very good. Uh, it seems like there may be uh, some usage for it in those conditions, uh, and, and which, as Gordy talked about with the, with the v, VWAS, you know, if you're looking at being able to use something for VFR conditions, at least you can do it during those time frames. And so our team may, may be able to provide some things there. But there are some outliers, and I'll talk more about that because those showed up in just uh, just about every single variable that we looked at. Uh, and there was also some concerns with mountainous regions. Uh, I mean, again, you just think about how far out can you expand an observation, uh, and if you're uh, in a fl relatively flat area, you can extend much further than if you're in an area with complex terrain, especially with mountains. For visibility. Again, we saw very good VFR results, but for anything less than VFR, the results just simply weren't very good at all. And again, we had outliers that existed. We went, we went back and we looked at temperature, even though we were already using temperature, and we found that the RTMA did, 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 did really well. And uh, it, it, it is uh, relatively, I, I, I don't want to say something on record here that will get me in trouble, but it, it, it did well. Let's leave it at that, but there are some outliers. Surface pressure, again, did well. Outliers, there's some concern in complex terrain, again, where you've got a lot of variation in the terrain going up and down. Uh, you may not want to use RTMA in those conditions. And then wind speed, we broke it down for 
what we called uh, relatively low wind speeds, that is less than or equal to 15 knots and then higher wind speeds. And we found that it did well for the lower wind speeds, not as well for the higher ones. Now, let me talk a little bit about what I meant by the outliers. Uh, the graph that you see on the right, this is an example for uh, temperature that we did over the conus. I want you to concentrate and look at that middle column that uh, along the x-axis is labeled EXP. This is the experimental results where we removed the airport observations and then ran it to see what we got. These are box plots that if you look in the middle of that, of that column, there's the red line with the box around it. That box represents the 25th and 75th percentiles. 50% uh, of your values fell within that range and they were, the, they were within plus or minus two degrees, which was our criteria that we used. Now you see all those others, what we call whiskers, the blue ones that are extending up uh, to plus 20 and slightly above it, and then down to around minus 20. Those are the outliers. We don't know what those are coming from. Are they from the same locations over and over again? Are they due to ones that have maybe a regional uh, aspect to them? Uh, we just simply don't know from our first assessment. So if you'll go to the next slide. Phase two is we want to build upon what we did with phase one. And we want to examine those outliers. That's the first thing we want to do is go back and look at those and determine if there was any trends in the data. As I said, uh, it may be the same stations that are over and over again contributing to the outliers. It might not be. We simply don't know at this time. Again, it may be um, geographical uh, locations might have something to do with it. Um, you know, you could think of a lot of different things. So we want to look at the outliers and determine the trends. Then we want to look at the data and, and break it up. Uh, I've said regional, but it, it, it's really more than regional. We, we could say we could just do a northwest, southeast type of thing over the CONUS, uh, northwest, southwest, central, those types of things. But we'd like to break it up into some type of geographical uh, patterns or, or having to do with terrain. Things that come to mind would be coastal environments versus those that are further inland, mountain environments. Um, we also want to look at station density. How well do we do in an area where you have multiple observations? The thinking is that if, you, if in that area, you would certainly do better than in an area where you had an isolated observation and then you didn't have another one for several hundred miles i.e. the Alaska situation. So we want to take a look at that. And then the, the, how we're going to do this is we're going to run sensitivity experiments. Rather than running these data denial experiments that, as I said, are very computationally expensive, take a lot of time, is the folks at, at EMC at the Weather Service have told, have, have um, they can develop a system that will measure the impact of the sensitivity of a single observation when it's missing or a grouping of observations that they're missing. They can do this, it can be done in real time. And the beauty of this is not only gives us an indication of how important and the error of that, that observation, but then this would be available to continue to run. So when we have an upgrade to the RTMA in the future, we don't have to go back and repeat all of this uh, data denial experiments in order to come up with new values or to see how well we're done, but it will continue to compute these for us. So we're very excited about this and looking forward to it. Next slide, please. So quick overview. Right now, we are working out the details contractually between the FAA and the Weather Service uh, and uh, getting funds over to them in order to be able to start the effort to look at the outliers, to look at the regional perspectives and breaking that down and then doing the sensitivity experiments. It's going to be at least a 13 month effort, uh, and, but uh, we hope to get that underway, I would say, within the next uh, probably one to two months, uh, being optimistically about that. And so uh, perhaps next spring, we can give another update on where we are and what we're seeing with that. 
And again, that's all that I have right now. Very high level for you, but there's my contact information and I'm certainly willing to take any questions that you might have right now. All right. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, David has a question. Uh, were all mesonet OBS included in the RTS, RTMA assessment studies? The mesonet OBS that go into the system on a regular basis, those were, were maintained and included. And um, Let's see, you may have already covered this, but would RTMA validate against meets our upsides? Um, not sure if I understand the question. I mean, that's what we that's what we looked at. Yeah, is you know we we meet ours and reran RTMA and then compared to what it was with the um, when the RTMA or when the METAR was there. So I don't know if that's what it's referring to or if there's an ongoing, there is ongoing verification that the weather service does. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't know that I'm fully answering the question. Uh, well, he had a follow up. This is from Don Bershoff. The uh, do mesonet sites that were used have ceiling and visibility measurements. I don't know for sure. Uh, the uh, the folks at EMC, uh, we could follow up and they could get the definitive answer on that, but I know that many of them do not. Um, we did a study, separate study on uh, ceiling and visibility capability now a year or so ago, and many of the mesonet sites do not include ceiling and visibility. And unfortunately, many of them that do um, aren't reliable enough, for lack of a better term. For example, when it comes to visibility, many of them will report a value up to, let's just say, one mile, and then that's it. Anything anything above one mile, I mean, that that's its greatest reporting. So you may have a 10-mile visibility, but the station's only going to be reporting one. So we saw some things like that. Um, Ceiling, we just didn't see a lot of them. So again, I, I I don't think a lot of them have it, unfortunately. Okay, and uh, Matias has a comment here. It will be important to stratify validation against environment like open space as in airports and complex terrain like mountains or urban environments. Um, so that was a comment, so any comment back on that or well I, I agree with that and we are open we are very much open to ideas about how we should stratify that data um, and you know those are the types of things that we're that we want to make sure that we capture um, as I've said you know we we're, we're looking at uh, I think larger scale types of things flat terrain versus mountain terrains but the idea of uh, open space versus urban versus forested, all of those things start to come into play. So, you know, if, if, if anybody's got any ideas about stratifying, no guarantees that we'll be able to do it, but I certainly would be open to those. Let us know about them. So, so, so Dave, this is Matt. It, I'm, I'm looking at the questions and, and, and it, it seems like to me <laughs> that this may be one of those uh, opportunities for us to, um, to, to to perhaps open this up to some kind of non-chaotic um, discussion. I know Ken Fenton has put several comments in there that I think are are appropriate um, to to what's been discussed. As has as has Paul Hepner, and maybe we could ask um, first Ken and then and then Paul to chime in with their with their inputs here. And and additionally, uh, Michael yeah. has asked a couple of times about. Uh, some uh, error statistics. So, um, which one did you say go first, Matt? Uh, Ken, from the. Uh, sorry, Ken. I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher you. I'm gonna butcher the letter. So I'm just gonna say from Ken. <laughs> well, thanks, Matt. This is well, Ken from uh, Quality Assessment Product Development Team. And so, uh, a couple of years ago, we did a ceiling and visibility assessment comparing the RTMA 
the RTMA rapidly updating version, the GLAMP and the NCVA, the National Ceiling and Visibility Analysis. Um, and so we have a full report that we can make available um, to those that are interested that was commissioned by the FAA. Um, so that would answer some questions about the RTMA error statistics for ceiling and visibility that was asked by Michael Split. And then just to dive into uh, just a quick overview of the amount of information that's available, there's in the continental United States or the contiguous part, the lower 48, there's on the order of several hundred visibility mesonet stations. Um, of these, like Danny was saying, a large number of them have to be um, filtered out because of various quality control reasons, because they don't report the full range of values or um, they don't report often enough to be useful. Um, so in our study, we ended up with about 300 or so stations that were actually useful um, over about a one year period. On the ceiling side of the house, uh, there's on the order of about 100 or so stations in the lower 48. And um, of those, we ended up with about 60 stations or so that yielded useful information for our assessment. Obviously, up in Alaska, the amount of data is far more limited. I think there's around um, 11 visibility mesonet stations up in Alaska and I think even fewer ceiling ones, although I haven't looked specifically into the ceiling study. Um, but that's the information I can provide. Uh, just shoot me an email, kenfenton at noaa.gov if you're interested in that ceiling and visibility assessment and happy to answer any other questions you have. I believe the other one you mentioned, Matt, was uh, Paul, is that correct? Yes, hi, this is Paul Hepner. Um, formerly did some work with the uh, National Mesonet Program. Um, from what I saw, at least when I was doing the, that, that work, a lot of the state mesonet stations did not have ceiling and visibility, but uh, some do have webcams, so there could be some implied uh, knowledge from that. It was also a, a commercial network. I don't know what the status of it is, but I'll just call it out from what I knew at the time called uh, Helios, which was, I think, being done by Harris. And that was a whole network of, uh, of cameras uh, specifically to be looking at uh, looking at visibility. So that I don't know what the status of that is and what the relationship of that is with Matus. Um, regarding the Arwis stations, it did have a comment that I did notice quite a few that had uh, limited visibility sensors. It was capped at a mile or two, so it was exactly what the what Danny was saying a few moments ago. Um, it, the whole purpose is for road weather, so they're not looking at the sky, they're looking at you know, things down near the ground and uh, you know, looking for the one quarter mile visibility and dense fog situation. So um, that, that tends to be the purpose of, of visibility with the Arwis, uh, Arwis stations. Okay, and um, if uh, Michael Split, if you wanna Speak of now, you had a couple of questions uh, that came in concerning, okay. I believe it was about accuracy, but go ahead with your comments. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just, when it comes to RTMA, and we, you know, I, obviously as a meteorologist, you can see where kind of observations are being expanded to fill large areas. But what about getting to users, you know, users that aren't MET savvy? And is there a way to transmit error information so people know where it might be less reliable? Yeah, Michael, that, this is Danny. This is that's a very good question, and and yes, that that's part of what we want to be able to do is is you know we we fully understand that users we're talking about here are not meteorologists, and and so. Uh, we need to give them uh, point information that, that's direct and, and good information. And, and so if we can determine the, and it, like I said, with this real-time system doing the sensitivity as part of that, that goes along with it, is a, is a, a measure of reliability or confidence. Uh, and so that, that, that's a very good point. I'm glad you raised it. And it's something that we are aware of and that we hope to be able to work into that too. Okay, by my assessment, Matt, that's all the questions or comments that we had in queue, unless there's any others that um, 
Well, one just came in from Tara Ladwig. It's a, it's a comment that says that the 3D RTMA currently under development at EMC plans to include uncertainty data with the analysis. And, and I was thinking to myself, even as as uh, as Michael and Danny were chatting, that <clears throat> that that some of the work, as, as you well know, Dave, that we're doing with the terminal wind translation auto optimization, you know, has has some kind of a um, a, a confidence component that that says that you know we are very confident in this information, or we are moderately confident, or you know what we're not so confident at all, and and we're not we're not trying to therefore tell users what to do with it, but but to but to ascribe certain properties to it that that will help either human users or or consuming decision support systems tools to to do the proper thing with the information. Yeah, just a just a comment from Gordy here. Um, so you know the thought process is is you know the evaluation that uh, that EMC is doing. Danny's working with uh, the uh, the RTMA. The output is really, I mean, from the end user, the output is is kind of the the big big picture. In in my mind, if it's hosted on an FAA website or a weather service website, what whatever whatever we can come up with, and if that variability can be can be known, you know, how good is it? How just like you were saying, the confidence level of that, uh, you, you certainly could you could certainly could draw boundaries around that as far as mitigations for use. For example, uh, if you're missing a a, a a visibility sensor in Hibbing, Minnesota, and you're a 121 carrier, you can't operate to Hibbing, Minnesota without the visibility. You can't operate, so there's not there's no weather there, and and so that's that's what the FAA says, and and that's that to me that's the right thing to do. However. 99% of the time, the, the visibility is going to be well above uh, minimums to uh, to operate on any any of the approaches up there in Hibbing, Minnesota. So how good is RTMA in Hibbing, Minnesota? You know, I mean, so let's say it's plus or minus two miles. Well, if the RT if the RTMA says the visibility is 10, you know, go ahead and use it. And and that's really where we need to kind of get to with this information is is first you analyze where it can be. Matt, excellent comment on the confidence level, and then you draw a box around it. You know, and, and as you add more sensor ground truth, if you add more VWAS to it, like we're planning to do in Alaska, now it's going to get better and better. You know, and that and that variability, that confidence is going to is going to get a little bit a uh, little bit higher. You know, as far as uh, how good it is, the goodness of the data. So, so uh, Danny, this is Matt. I have a question. Um, and 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 um, th th this is truly a curiosity question on my part. Um, it's not it's not a loaded question. It's not trying to set anything up. I just I don't know the answer to it. What's the relationship between RTMA and the HEMS tool? Uh, they're not related. Um, as Ken talked about, Ken Fenton talked about the the evaluation that we did, uh, looking at CNV that included RTMA and also the lamp tool, and comparing it against the at the time the National Ceiling and Visibility Analysis, which is in the HIMS tool. Um, that assessment, uh, RTMA did not come out as the uh, I'll say the winner, and thus the decision was made to incorporate LAMP into the HIMS tool. Um, and so that's where we're going right now. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's just, they're, they're two separate things right now and there's no connection between them that I'm aware of. And, and, I, and I guess, and again, I apologize. It was not meant to be a loaded question. It's just, it's, it's something that, you know, I, I see these two things out there that, that perhaps not completely, but in some respects overlap one another as far as what capabilities they they uh, they, they provide. And you know there's a there's a there's a part of me that that sort of wonders, you know, would we be better served by 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 putting resources in one versus the other? And I, I don't know the answers to the questions. I just it's just a, it's an itch in my head, and I, I, I wish I knew the answer better. Yeah, Matt. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, 
It's not a new question. I mean, uh, you know, all of us who have been around for a while know that we have, uh, for different phenomenon, we have different products uh, that are giving the same information. You know, think back to, you know, and it, and it still exists for convective weather information. Mm-hmm. You know, at, at, um, at, I know at one time we were looking at probably 20 different products, and that may still be out there today for all I know. But again, there's multiple products. But when it came to the HIMSS tool, we did we did take a look at RTMA, and uh, and quite frankly, LAMP outperformed it for for seal and invisibility. But you know, there's more than seal and invisibility, uh, so we're looking at everything else. And and yeah, it, you know, it may be that in this second assessment, it may turn out that you know the results just aren't that great. I mean, and and so I don't I don't want us to to get the impression that we're pushing RTMA to be the answer here. We're looking at it as it may be the answer, but we need to find out some more stuff about it. So I, I just kind of leave it at that. That, 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 was a, that was a great answer, Danny, and, and thank you for that. Um, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I want to add something here regarding the HEMS tool. It's really a tool to visualize, look at data relative to ground level. And that's the way it was designed when, when this started off to uh, make uh, information accessible in a georeferenced way relative to ground level, because that's how the low level operations work. They're concerned about the weather, about you know how high above ground they are operating, et cetera. So the HEMS tool is really a display capability to show weather information relative to ground level. But what you actually feed it in terms of weather information, there's different options. And, and so I think we need to keep that separate and, and not talk about the HEMS tool as weather information. It's a way to access it. Okay, I, I I I I understand what you're saying, and and I'm I'm confident you are correct. I, I I guess then I would change my question to, is the is the underlying is the data or, or is the is the data and means of processing the underlying data in RTMA, um, and and that which is in in hems are they identical or is there one that is better than than the other and and i guess i guess that's the part that i'm still trying to 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 get straight in my head here by the way matthias so, so our team oh i'm sorry i i just stepped on somebody i'll i'll get out here in just a sec I, I must say that that this sort of opening up the mics and inviting discussion has gone way better than I thought it was going to until I stepped on whoever that was I just stepped on. No, Matt, that's okay. This is Danny. I was going to respond to you. So, yes, RTMA does things differently than LAMP does. Uh, and RTMA does things differently than a data assimilation for a numerical weather model. Uh, and so, yeah, well, I mean, when you look under the hood, that's probably why we have different products because there are different ways of doing things of bringing all the information together and which one is best well it depends um it depends on what variable you're looking at it depends on the use of the of the information it depends on where you're looking at geographical regions those types of things um every product has its strengths and has its weaknesses and so you know when when we come down to trying to look at one product um, you know, you have to take all of that in, in, into consideration. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers it completely, but yes, they are. They do. They do things differently. So that was good, and, and we're in danger of wandering into single authoritative source territory here if we continue further. <laughs> hey, Matt Rex Alexander here. Hope you're doing well. I know uh, Mateus and I have had this conversation multiple times, but um, from a Hems pilot or from a guy that runs um, a part 135 system and lands everywhere but an airport where an AWAS is located, landing in bean fields, corn fields, and cemeteries, I think the gravitation for pilots in the HEMS community towards the HEMS tool is its uh, capability to um, provide trends and looking at the trends of the weather because that's one of the things we look at is why we make the decision not to go. Is it getting better or is it getting worse? 
the data itself is important, but looking at the trends is, I would say, and in my opinion, as important, if not more so, to provide that in a rapid way that a pilot can make a better decision. Just based on my experience, and like I said, it's, we're not 121 guys. We we don't land at airports. We land everywhere, but and there's never a weather station where we land. And for that reason, Rex, when words like that come out of your mouth, I tend to sit up straighter and listen more carefully. I just thought it was my magnetic personality. Uh, well, there is that too. <laughs> Are there any are there any other questions for for Danny or or myself? Yeah, this is Dave Kutchvar. Do I sound any better now? They sound, sound good. Okay, wonderful. Um, I just wanted to to bring up something. I see uh, Terry Ladwig kind of had a had a comment of this in the chat as well. Um, I, I think we need to be careful about separating RTMA from gridded lamp and a lot of these these uh, gridded forecast guidance that we have going into tools like HEMS in that it is very much associated with the gridded forecast that you're creating. You know, in, in, a, in a simple uh, explanation, you need an initial condition to run a forecast model. And for a lot of these gridded forecasts we're seeing right now, RTMA is that initial condition. So they're separate, but they're also equal. So I think it's just an important distinguishment that we need to be careful of. Thanks, David. And uh, I appreciate I appreciate everyone's comments here. This is all this is all very very good discussion. And and one of the things that I think is is kind of important to keep an eye on. And Danny alluded to a little bit, but. You know, we've got a lot of different products that have been developed for different reasons over the years. And and, and really, what are we trying to solve? And, and what information do we need? Do we need it in a forecast? Do we need it, as Rex pointed out, what does he need? He needs trend information. And, and trend information for a helicopter emergency management or helicopter operation, you know, for short duration is, is critical. And, and so how do, how do we provide, how do we fill those gaps and how do we fill those voids? I think it's incumbent on the FAA to to identify really what are the needs moving forward. Um, you know, and, and you know, I just want to be clear. Our our session here was to really focus on uh, filling the void of the needs for ground truth. Um, but a lot of really good discussions come up with, well, how good is it? You know, what what are its uses? What are the other options? And 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 really, what are we trying to feed? So, the feedback from Rex and and, and the pilot workforce and that community is is, is critical to kind of capture that uh, moving forward. Really, trying to figure out well, are, are we going to are we going to hit the mark, or are we going to are we going to swing wildly and and strike out? And we hope we don't strike out, but you know we're we're putting a lot of eggs in our basket on the VWAS. Um, not a lot of eggs, enough eggs. But you know we're we're also looking at RTMA. Well, there's other things out there, you know the national blend of models. I mean, there's other th there's other things that are that maybe provide um, input to what the output we're looking for. So I just wanted to make that comment. Um, anybody else got any comments on that, Matt or Matthias or Danny? Someone was going to speak. <laughs> Danny or David? Sounds like we're 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 all commented out, and um, um, this is actually a wonderful uh, break point for our next break. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, Gordy, just for what it's worth, you have you have gained back the ten minutes we lost in our. Um, um, having the administrator up front. So splendid job. Thank you very much for that. Um, let's take a break uh, until 1445 Eastern time or 1045 Alaska time and whatever is in between. And uh, we'll come back and get into the third uh, panel in, in your session, Gordy.